Okay, uh, yes. NLP here means natural language processing, not neural linguistic processing, just in case you're on the wrong talk. And transfer learning is something that's a little like hot topic in natural language processing. Here, I'm just gonna give like a very basic overview and some introductions. So if you already know some bits of this thing, most likely you can just skip the talk. Nobody? Okay. Just a show of hands, who works with like text and data science here? Okay, a few here and there, and then uh, who are just like web engineers? Yes, cool people. Mobile engineers also included. Like, no one? Mobile engineers? Nobody? Okay. Then who are just students or one, two? Like, what does the rest do? I'm curious. Just shout out what you do. Like, there are many people who don't do data or web stuff. Computer vision? Computer vision? Uh, Okay, that's still data stuff that's counted. Like, who, who are just pure researchers here? Nobody? Okay. Yeah, I'll repeat, I'll say, again, this is uh, transfer learning in natural language processing, and if you know a bit of this, this stuff, this is basically introductory, then you can skip the talk. I'm gonna distract you with like very cute photos of sushi, if that is okay. And uh, I'm leading, and that's my handle there. Alvations, you can search me online if you cannot find who is leading Tan. And yeah, let's continue. So in NLP, there are many, many different tasks, and each task requires different data. There are basically three kinds of data that you will normally find. One is just plain text data. They appear everywhere online. They appear on the streets. You can take photo of them, scan them, OCR them. And then there's natural occurring data, like the task for machine translation or the next sentence prediction. Basically, if you have a document, you already have data for next sentence prediction, right? Because sentence one follows sentence two. Nobody disagree with me. Like usually two follows one, but it's okay. And then you have this whole bunch of very, very specific hand-labeled data for sentiment analysis. You have all these people just labeling positive, negative, positive, negative, neutral. And then somebody coming in and say, hey, we need to change this to like a five-point scale. One, two, three, four, five. Hey, we need to change this to a seven-point scale. And this is just senseless labeling and takes a lot of time. So we have lots of the plain text, we have possibly quite a lot of the natural occurring text, and then we don't have a lot of um, hand-labeled data, and that is where you need kind of transfer learning. You want to transfer the knowledge that you can learn from these large data sets into the smaller data sets. So how can we really do it? Suggestions? Just in case I get like very good suggestions. Nobody? Okay, other than transfer learning, uh, I think that is the only hottest topic in natural language processing to do it. Uh, but I think there's also a group of people doing unsupervised learning, basically learning directly from the data without annotations and trying to generate annotations out. Those are a little stranger, but this case, um, we can discuss more after the talk. So transfer learning is something like this. You have a sushi, you learn different parts of the sushi together, and you only want to learn on all kind of sushi. Every possible kind that you can, you squeeze them into one row and you learn them about crabs, about... I don't know, is this avocado or is this pear? Avocado, okay. I'm not so vegetarian like this. Okay, but um, in terms of the learning paradigms in machine learning as well as natural language processing, you have supervised learning where you have the data, you want to train towards something that is domain specific. So you train from like making nigiri sushi, just the fish on top of the rice, and then you train like maki sushi, you have fish inside the rice, which is inside the nori, uh, the seaweed, and then you have like almost the same as nigiri, but you want to wrap it over. You train multiple small things to train, to do one multiple small tasks, right? And then you have multi-task learning, where you train all of them together, put all the different data sets together and see what you can do. It's a little different from what we discussed just now on just using plain text and natural occurring text. These are still small data sets that you have. You want to combine them and learn them together. So in total, they can be big, but they are still not as big as the ones that you find that is natural occurring or just normal plain text. Now the last one is really interesting where you learn everything at the same time. It is one kind of multitask learning, but you also make use of just no labels and train a model. How do you train the model? 
and what do you use it for? It's really for the end. Like after you train a generic model that does generic tasks, you want to specify and see how you can make, let's say, nigiri sushi only. And there are only three steps in transfer learning, which it looks cool, but then it's just basically train on the very large data. That's number one, pre-training. Fine tuning. After that, you have this small set of data. Then you also have the labels that comes with the data. What you can do is you don't use the labels at all, and you fine tune the small set, uh, fine tune the model based on the small set of data. And what you do is you learn it the same way as you learn in the pre-training. So that is called a fine tuning, or sometimes called as an adaptation phase. And then the last part is the downstream application. Basically, after you learn and you adapt the model, what you want to do is to do one specific task. Let's say classification, or you want to do some labeling stuff. Right, so pre-training, we learn everything that we want about many generic things. I'll describe what is generic in natural language processing later. And then you use the pre-trained model to update the, you use the small data set to, pre, to fine tune the model, and then you use it on the downstream tasks. And the downstream tasks are tasks like text classification. For labeling, you have sequence generation, let's say for summarization or sentence completion. And then you have regression tasks that just want to predict a number. Some cases, like you want to know how similar a, text, a pair of text is, or you want to assign a probability to some text or some data. So yes, I've talked a lot about sushi, so not a lot about text. Anyone curious why? You like sushi. That's true. I like sushi a lot, but also because computers don't really understand text. They only understand characters and strings. So what you usually do is you have a sushi that is called spicy or toro. What typically like people that work with text does is they want to convert it into numbers. Even labels, you don't want, num you don't want labels because something that's discrete like one value, it's very hard to control. But if everything is converted to just array of floats or array of integers, that will make life easier for anyone doing computing, right? Agree, disagree? Anybody like to write regex? Come talk to me. I also like to write like regex. <laughs> okay, basically the idea is, can you have something that will convert an image or even a text? And then what you want to do is convert them to some representation. In this case, it's an array of integers. And then try to map them to a specific set of labels that are also assigned some specific array of integers that are different, right? You can see that maybe, I don't know which one are similar. They all look very different. So what you need is you need a pair of chopsticks. And this chopsticks is your model itself. It will try to map these numbers to these other numbers. And that is basically NLP. My talk has ended. Okay, this joke never works. <laughs> and you really want to map them to the correct spiciness of this spicy or toro, right? So who knows an easier way to do this? No models, no nothing. Like anyone can think of a very easy way to solve this problem. I give you a string spicy or toro, you tell me the label. Nobody? Uh, you have string one in string two, yes or no, boolean. And then string one in string three, yes or no. So you have spicy in spicy or toro, yes or no. Sweet in sweet or toro, yes or no. And then at the end you get the correct answer too, right? Easy? Sometimes it's the solution to do NLP. Not in this talk, so I'll continue. <laughs> Sequence generation is the same thing, where let's say the task is you want to know which sushi gets served on a conveyor belt, right? You have the first sushi, which is your context. You really, sometimes you know, right? You see like sushi come first, then desserts, then comes the drink, and then comes more sushi. Then you realize that they put one whole long chain of very expensive sushi and you just wait there and then the cheap sushi never comes. Then that's how they make you buy more. So <laughs> basically what you do is you put it through the model, it generates the next one, it picks the correct sushi. That's like picking up a word, right? And then so on and so forth until the point you get a receipt. And that is usually how the sequence ends. So if you think about this, picking sushis and picking rows of numbers, putting into a model is exactly how a word works, right? If you have the word sushi, most likely you'll have to pick one of the more probable words. 
and then you have something like a sequence. Sushi is yummy, and then you have the end of sentence, which is your receipt. So in this case, uh, if you know about sushi or sushi-tology, I just made that word up. Uh, <laughs> There are actually sequential ways of how you eat sushi because you eat from the lightest taste to the heaviest taste. And the same way language is structured in a left to right, right to right, left, in some ordered kind of manner, that's why you can do this generation. There are other cases where you don't have order. I will show you at the end of my talk, which you will see why it's so powerful. So that's just generating text, right? Can you do the same thing with question and answering? Let's say if the first sushi is just representing, do you like sushi? That's a question. Do you like sushi? No. Nobody likes sushi here. Okay. Tomorrow, no sushi on menu. Today, tomorrow, is there lunch? I don't know. But <laughs> okay. So you also want to generate answers out, right? What you do is you do exactly the same chain of sequence generation that you will do, and you will say, yes, is the first. Uh, word generated after the question, do you like sushi? Then I do, maybe that's a representation of a word too. But all these are all represented by the same fixed size vector that you always see an array of three integers. And this is where um, CPUs and all your matrix calculation comes in. Because they are fixed size integers, you can easily sum them. Summing two fixed size integers gives you the same fixed size integer. You can easily do dot product and you get a scalar to get some point. You can easily do cross products and you'll get almost the same size integer where you can just resize. That is text generation, right? The last thing is you can do regression. Something like this is kind of fun. You have two sushi, you want to know how much alike it is. You get 21% and then this two sushi looks more or less, more similar than the first two pair. And that's why you get 87%. Um, Similarly, if the sushi are just pronounced as word, you have plum maki and egg nigiri, which is very far away because the words don't, totally don't match at all. But if you have salmon nigiri and egg nigiri, then you will say that they are very close together. In that case, you can use string, but wouldn't it be cooler if you can just put in two string of floats or two string of, uh, two, two array of floats or two array of integers? Right, so that's the end of the first part of the talk. Yeah, but whatever I'm explaining now, it's still kind of like train, right? I still need to train a model. I still need to have these data occurring in order to train some numbers out. Like in this case, I need data of pairs of things and some labels in order to train a classifier there. And in the case of generation, also the same thing. I still need this question and answer pairs to appear. But are there cases where it doesn't need to appear? So in that case, you will need to use something that's more um, modern. It's called pre-training model, transfer learning. Or what you really do is you'll train a model and then you'll use the model. But I'm not going through the training now because actually the training and the usage is almost the same today. So, but let's go through some basics and then you'll realize that they, are, they can be the same. Uh, you can find the... Is, the font too bright, maybe. Uh, you can find the notebook at the end of the talk. I will not post it here. It will not be public, but I will have slides on it and you can take a look as we walk through. So the basic idea is this. What you want is to convert this sushi or this text itself to an array of floats or integer that you can control. How do you do it, right? You put it through a model. How the model starts out is you have a string made up of different words. Let's say in this case, you have the class. This is just a like boilerplate word that you must always put. Uh, I can explain why in the end, but let's say this is existing, and then you have a certain sentence, and then you have a separator that's, that indicates end of the sentence, and then another sentence, and the same uh, separator that indicates the end of sentence. Anybody know why this play and this hash, hash ing is split? Nobody? Anybody knows why? No? Okay, so in linguistics, this is called morphology, where the word itself is play, is a verb, it's an action word, and ing is an inflection. It changes the, not the meaning of the core, the core meaning of the word, but how the word is represented or how the word state is like. In this case, it's split up because the model has learned that Splitting it up will let me have more power. I can use less number of symbols to represent more words. Let's say if I have play, playing, and 
run, running, I need four symbols to represent forwards, right? If I have play, run, and ing, I can actually use three symbols to represent forwards itself. So it's kind of a compression theory within NLP, and this is how uh, modern day uh, libraries for NLP actually split up words, which is uh, technically terms, it's called tokenization. So that's why you have each word representing, represented by some embeddings. These embeddings are just the array of floats that you see. There's also this thing called segment embedding. What it does is it indicates the start and the end of the sentence. So in this case, this EA are just symbols of, that represent uh, an array of numbers again. And you have this AAAA here, which represents the same first sentence, and this BBBBBB here, that represents the second sentence. So that is called a segment embedding, or sentence embedding, you can think of it that way. And then you have position. Basically, this is just enumerate function in Python. Enumerate 0 to 10. Why is that important? Because if, the, if we were to do things that are not left to right, we will need to know where the position occurs for each word. Otherwise, the same word cute here, and let's say there's another cute at the end, they'll be represented the same way if there's no order involved. Make sense? So this number here, position embedding, is to encode the order information inside the language. So it makes sense, right? The first one represents the word, the second one represents the sentence level, the third one represents order. And ongoing research have been just adding more layers, removing the layers, compressing the layers. Okay, let's look at the first part where it has this string and it splits up into that hash hash symbol. I use exactly the same string, I do a split on it, and then I do the tokenization function. So this library is called a transformer library. It is one of the most popular state-of-art library for natural language processing. Uh, it is based on PyTorch and TensorFlow, if you know about them. But for the most of the talk, you only need to know that this library converts your text into the numbers that we want. In this case, the tokenizer is trained, and it will split up the sentence string into the words that you have here. Even if you add a comma here, it will still split it up correctly. So, anyone spot a mistake in the function? No? Likes? He likes playing. No, it's the same. Okay. Uh. No, why not like? Because it doesn't change the name, right? The, the, it doesn't change. It's just tokenizing. It's just splitting into the word forms. So I'll go back to the next previous slide. Playing. Yes, playing. Why is it missing? Like, no matter what you do to it, I spent like 30 minutes looking at this and like, why is it that the paper used this example and has playing, but the code never reproduces it? And then I went down and dig a little bit more. And I found out, oh, the playing is in a fixed set of the word. Then you can fetch the word directly. But then let's say you have the word slacking. It's not found, but slack is found and ing is found, then it will split it up. So these are like minor intricacies of the libraries that you will use for natural language processing that normally people wouldn't care about, but if you look deeper, then you realize why is this happening and you need to take a look. So word piece is the algorithm name, it's just a tokenizer kind of um, algorithm, and then the vocabulary stores this. Uh, this list mapping from the string to this list of um, floats or integers representing the, each, each word in the vocabulary. Okay, so yeah, by the way, anybody like wondering what is BERT? So BERT is just the algorithm name that is used for this transformer. There are many kinds of transformer like Optimus Prime Megatron, Bumblebee. That would be direction. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, so you didn't say direction. Yes, but but none of them are real transformers in the algorithm. Okay. Previously, I was just listing like transformer the cartoon. But the real transformer names are like Bert, Oscar, um, Ernie, Elmo, Cookie Monster, Big Bird, and I can't think of Sesame Street names. It's very strange. There's a, there's a chart where it shows like how people name the algorithms for this transformer base. Transformer is just some kind of mathematical algorithms that we can talk more about it after the class, after the talk. Sorry. 
okay, um, yes. So how do we get this segment ID, right? This segment ID just splits the sentence up. But if you write some kind of code, you have to loop through and check whether it's separated, increase the, increase the enumerate and then keep track of where's the previous one and then you break out again and then change the number and include. Uh, so I wrote that and then I went to Stack Overflow and then I asked a question like, is there a simpler way to do this? So this Divika, which is really nice, just answered me in two lines. Hey, you can do this in like some NumPy gymnastics, which I have not figured out why this minus thing <laughs> will remove. So, so this cumulative sum will actually put a two here, which just means that if something is there, you just literally just go like zero, 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 zero. Once it is here, you include a one, so one, 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 one. But then at the end, it will actually break and say a two. So this minus m here just remove the last one. I have no idea why it works. NumPy and Stack Overflow always works. But the point is, you can also write the same uh, for loop that you can loop through and just get the same output. So here it is. It represents the first sentence, second sentence. And then the last part is here. How do you really compute, right? You can't really compute based on different types here. You have lists of strings for the first one and then you have this uh, NumPy array. So we'll use this library called Torch, and these Torch tensors will, will kind of put them together into the same object, and you can pass it to the library for Torch and Transformer library in order to process the text and convert them into the vector that you want. So Torch is a deep learning library. You can read more about it in, uh, online, as well as yesterday there's a dev talk or dev conference for Torch. And yeah, it's a cool library. Okay. So this is how you load the model up. The model contains nothing but just a lot of floats kept in correct order as well as some kind of hash mapping to tell you how the floats are retrieved. Uh, first, you will import Torch and then you would have this thing that people like to use. It's an idiom. Uh, meaning that it's just copied and paste. Device equals CUDA if CUDA is available, else CPU. Basically, the Torch library can make use of both the GPU as a CPU and the CPU, depends on what is available on your system. So every time you load a model, in this case, we imported BERT model previously, and then we save from pre-train, and there's a list of different variations of the same model, and you can just find the list mapping inside the documentation of the transformer library. But when you use the model, you will use this dot eval here. This dot eval just says that you're using. If you don't do it, then it's unclear whether you're using or you're training the model. And the model will assume that you're training. And then it will generate a lot more overhead when you use. Because for training, you actually keep these things called gradients. And these gradients are used to compute and update the list of floats inside the model. So in simple cases, you use them, so you use dot eval. The more important thing is actually the two device. There's a big difference. When you use the GPU and CPU, every time you have a model, you have a tensor, you always send it to the correct device that you need. So in this case, this two device here is there. Every time you'll see this error that says uh, CPU tensor in GPU or GPU tensor, CUDA tensor in CPU, then you just have to find out in your code where's the two device missing. Tip. Okay. And then when you use the model, you have previously stored the tensor, right? Like here, we convert them into the tensor objects. We'll just put it into the function. The model is some sort of a class where the default function will just feed the input into the model and output the tensor that you want, which here is an array of, array of floats. I'll describe what the, the dimension means later on. So similarly, tensors you put to device, and then when you use, since you don't want any gradient, you just say touch no gradient. And this width here is a context manager. It's like how you open files. You have a width open file name as fin, and then outside of the width indentation, the file actually just get discarded and got into the garbage collector. The same way when you have touch no grad, it actually says anything inside the indentation of the touch no grad doesn't need gradient. And these are just minor implementations. But uh, if you like Python, this is actually very interesting. 
I think this is unique to Python and Python inspired languages, this context manager things. And also whoever in, inspired Python for the context manager. Okay. Yeah, I was doing, I was explaining this model thing. When you put the tensors into the model, you need the two components, right? Token and segments. Question, why is the third part missing? The one that you enumerate zero to the length of the word. Anybody knows why? Yes, only in Python you will have this because if you're writing in C or Java, now you have to write a lot of functions in order to enumerate a list, right? But in this case, since it's Python, the designer of the library or the designer of the algorithm itself already took care of this and says, hey, I can just loop through this and this and make sure that they are of the same size and enumerate. So this, like looking at the code itself, not only teaches you how to use the library, but also tells you about how the library was designed in such a way that it is user friendly. And this is important for any kind of open source project. Okay, now the output itself, right? This encoder layer, what is the shape? You see that it's just a lot of flows, a lot of numbers. That's what I tell people when they ask me, what do you do at work? I just look at a lot of numbers and a lot of colorful words. Not that colorful if you are on Jupyter Notebook. It's more colorful on my IDE. Okay, uh, <laughs> the layers itself, you see that there's three dimensions. When you do dot shape for any kind of torch tensor, it tells you the size, and this size object is literally just an array of um, integers. So the first number in the layer tells you the batch size. The second number layer tells you the sequence length. And the third number of layer tells you the hidden dimension. Who understands these three words? I just need to like get an indication. Oh, uh, these are not human words. Basically, it just tells you number of sentences, the length of the sentences that you have in the sentences, and then hidden information that the model provides. Means for every sentence, and the length of the sentence is actually providing 768 floating points to explain what is a sentence. Previously, we see one sushi is represented by three floats, right? Or three integers. In this case, you can see the computation memory that is inside this um, model kind of powerful, right? It's not just telling you the like a list of uh, numbers that represent something. It tells you a list of numbers that represent something plus the contextual information per word across the whole sentence. So imagine if the same sentence is there, you replace a word, actually not just one of the row will change, all the rows will ch change here. Make sense? So yeah. Okay, now, sanity check. We have everything there. We have the number of sentence. We have the length of the sentence. We have the info hidden information. So in that case, when we put a model through, or we put the sushi through the model, we actually get one whole compilation of this thing together in one big massive matrix. And that's how you convert uh, text into some array of floats or array of numbers. And that's how you use the bird library or that's how you use the transformer library, right? Okay, the question is how do you generate text then? Now I'm just representing text itself. If I want to generate text, how do I generate it? like this. For BERT, what it's very good at is it, it's good at filling in the blanks because when it trains the model, it trains the model by blanking out random words. And because you do that, you include noise in the model. Previously, people use supervised learning. The whole data is represented and mapped to the labels. In that case, there's no noise in the data. It's not getting robust. So to add robustness, you actually include some noise in by blanking out words. Then what do you guess? There's no labels, there's only text. So you guess what the word is, and that is the task of the training. Whenever you have a sentence, you just randomly blank out words and you guess the words. And then you measure how accurate the words are predicted. And then now you re-update your model itself to use the same, uh, to use the updated model to guess the next batch of sentences with the blank out words. That's BERT. Honestly, I never, so BERT is an acronym. It's some bi-directional encoder something for transformer. But yeah, I just call it blank out model. It just blank out words. Okay, so this blanking out mechanism is also called the mass language model here. So this mass language model is kind of special. 
you see, every time you load a model, you have the eval, you have the two device, but then you have all this big, big chunk of thing, right? If you look into every of the object listed here, these are how the model was created. Every layer that you see, this class, is a, is a matrix. The matrix is used to keep the memory and it multiplies the input tensors to produce the output tensors that you have. Then the output itself is passed to the second layer and so on and so forth all the way until the end. So deep learning is actually very complex. This kind of models is actually very complex. To understand it, I think we have not yet understand it. That's why all we do is we just fill in the blanks. Okay, so let's say if I have a sentence here. Uh, people at the end can see the sentence clearly, right? Or is it too small? Good. Okay, the sentence is, please don't let beep out of the beep. Wait, is this video recorded? I'm not censoring any word. I'm just saying beep on purpose because it's mask, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> here, the masking itself, it's how it was trained. But then how you use it, you can also use it to predict that mask word there. So I'll explain this. When we want to do text generation, we can think of it as filling in the blanks, and the blank itself doesn't necessarily need to be at the end. It can be in any part of the sentence, and we want to fill it in. Similarly, when we want to encode the model, we have to do all this gymnastic of like splitting the word into tokens, converting the tokens, getting the segments into uh, this 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 format, and then put them into a fixed kind of objects such that Torch or any deep learning library can understand. And this is the same thing we do for the mass language model. And then how we apply is exactly the same. You have the two device here. You have the two device here. There's some kind of minor differences in the library and how, it's, how it has chosen to put this as a keyword argument. But the same way, you feed the tensors into the model. The model spits out some output, which is a tensor of this size. Now, this size is very different, right? Previously, we have the number of sentence, the number of words in the sentence or tokens in the sentence, and then you have the hidden information. In this case, this is weird. One is the number of sentence. 14, if we count, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Anybody know why that's 14 if it's the number of words in the sentence? Slash? Uh, possible, but there's also one special thing happening here. Yes, so don't. So sometimes this is what text processor or tokenizer do. But slash n is totally possible. Uh, in this case, there's no slash n because it's not explicitly there. But uh, this don't would have most likely been split up in do apostrophe t to make up the 14 tokens here. So it is still tokenized, right? But what is this 30,522? Anybody have an idea? It's surely not the memory, right? We already know that for each word, it only keeps 700 over memory. Is it the weight of the network? No, not the weight of the network. Like, sometimes you don't know the library, you just play around, and then this happens. So you have to think, like, why did this happen? Because we want to guess a word. In that case, yes, it's the number of possible words in the dictionary. In that case, we call it the vocabulary size. So that means every input that we put in, it actually spits out for each sentence all the possible words, and each possible word has some value there. If we just do a max on the value, that is the most information or the most informative word, which means we can pick that word out and then we just replace it with, we just find the index of the word from the vocabulary and replace the mask with that word, right? Which is what this code is doing. So before I go on, to prove that it is, it is the number of words in the vocabulary, you can actually just check the tokenizer. You can retrieve the vocabulary with tokenizer.vocab. Uh, yes. So this bit here is um, NumPy array or Torch, er, torch tensor slicing, which just means that get the zero, f the first dimension, first, first of the first dimension up to the mass index, which means the last one, 
uh, the, the last dimension and then retrieve anything that's in there, which then you get into this one times 30,000 over. Okay, same to check. Oh, I explained that. I should have used the slide to explain. Pick the last dimension of the output tensor that is the same as the vocabulary size. Find the index and then convert the index into string. Why? Because uh, remember that this index here is just, oh wait, wait this, I skipped this step. Important. So if you have 30 over 1,000 numbers, right? Each number representing a, a word itself from the vocabulary. But these numbers itself are just raw numbers that are, they are just raw numbers that are real numbers. And what you do is you do an arc max, meaning you find the maximum number and find the position of the maximum number. And that is the position of the most probable word. And then now you have the position, you just go back to the, the dictionary itself. There's a very nice function here, convert ID to tokens, which just fetch the, the vocabulary index and you get to the word. Question, who can guess what is the word? This is interesting. Please don't let the beep out of the beep. What is the first bit? Cat? Who says cat? Like, 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 show of hand, who says cat? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, very good dictionaries. And then, uh, like, who says other word? Like, which other word can you put it here? The what? Dogs? Yeah, the dogs out of the door, maybe, dogs out of the something. Okay, but, the what? What's the word? I can't hear clearly. Aedes? Like mosquito? I, I don't like mosquitoes. They are horrible things. Okay, okay, let's, let's go. But the computational model thinks in weird and, wonder and like wonderful ways. The word is baby. Did you say babies or 80s? Babies. How do you know babies? How do you know? Yeah. Like that, uh, don't let baby. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, okay, then what are you going to put it out of? <laughs> That's the scarier part. Like, who, who knows out of the what? Bus. The bus? That's so... That, okay, okay. No, no tragedy. Next. <laughs> house. House, oh, house, maybe? home. Uh, okay, first, before that, we know the first word, right? But actually, you can just systemize this. You can put it in a function, loop through, find the index of the mask, and just predict. Simple stuff, for loop. Now, second word is bus, home. No one else have other words? Please don't let the baby out of the bag. The car. Yes, car maybe. Car is a good one. Safety. Off the way. <laughs> so yes, I don't know why you're out of the way or don't let the baby out of the way. I don't really get it, but that's what the model does. And you know this model is trained on the whole Wikipedia for English as well as the whole um, open source book corpus that's available. So that's a lot of text, like close to 800 million plus around 300 million, close to a billion words in it. The, yes, um, unfortunately my code doesn't do that, <laughs> but you can do a max and then you can um, specify how much is the max, how many top k you want, and then you can just fetch it. So of course this is the max. Uh, there's also something interesting here. Actually, if you initialize the seed differently, this will output a different number, a different word too. So you can play around with the code when it's released over the weekend. Okay, now we have many, many things. Uh, this just means ti shi hua, which means like shikumika in, in Japanese. It just means to systemize. We put everything together, everything we know, and we have this function. And then you see this weird stuff. What is this? Why are you replacing this space hex hex with nothing? And then you have this apostrophe T with like apostrophe T without spaces. Nobody knows? X hex is for the I. Ah, yes. Hex is. And the? Only one is like a step. Yes. So this, if you do NLP, this is most of your job. 
this modeling stuff is the boring things that you can do in like one hour and then this part you will spend five six hours trying to get the correct output out <laughs> okay you put in a function it's very very nice your boss is very happy with you and he goes like hey that's nice can i try with another word like another sentence so anybody with a guess drink beer and eat something fish fish is nice with beer and what chicken, chicken? Oh. Sushi. they're very close fish chicken sushi they're all meat <laughs> So yes, the model learns very stuff, very good stuff. And then the last sentence. If you just like drink coffee, it doesn't really know who you are. It's just like eat what? Eat it. <laughs> so the model also learned how to hedge, right? The model just like normalizes and say, people normally say that, so I will also say that. Okay, now we know how to generate text by filling in the blanks, right? But then you'll ask the same question, but I want it to generate the whole sentence. Can it really generate the whole sentence? Any idea? Like, let's say if this yummy is also question mark, question mark. Can it do the same thing? No? Actually, it can. So go back, get the same code, do this. Replace all this mask with like mask, 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 mask. As many masks as you want, or iterate through a for loop each time you go through the string, add a mask there. And then put it through the same function, you'll realize that it can generate text. So now, Using the same mechanism, you actually generated text by filling in the blank. It's just that now your blank is at the end of the sentence. That's what you do. And I guess uh, my time is up in three minutes. So yes, this is what you'll hear when you get out of the restaurant in a sushi bar. Thank you.